Hey everyone, I hope you're doing well. My name is Keshev and I'm the producer for this episode. Today's conversation is with Kathleen Brown, who is a senior student recruitment advisor with the CPA Atlantic School of Business. She completed her undergrad in international business with the Vancouver Island University, and then went on to do a master's degree in global business with the University of Victoria. And she joined Sam to discuss her role within the CPA program and with the Atlantic School of Business, and also what the PEP program is for CPA and how it's available to students and the recent changes it has, it has gone through in the past few years to make it more accessible and adaptable for students, particularly in terms of the timeline when you can get access to courses um, and, and how aggressive and, uh, and fast you wanna get them done. And so this was a really interesting conversation. And I think if you're considering doing the CPA program and not sure if you want to go the typical traditional route with a firm or take your own route or work with a timeline that is different from what is normal and what has been done in the past, this is a really interesting conversation uh, for you and you'll probably find a lot of value out of it. Thanks and enjoy. Welcome Kathleen. So this is the icebreaker. I had an interview, or not an interview, like a meeting with a student, a just entering fourth year student earlier, and asked her. I said, okay, we've taken away somebody's phone and told them they can only have three apps. We have um, had a couple other icebreakers, but the one that she suggested was, what was your first concert that you ever went to? Oh my goodness, I'm dating myself now. Okay, so it was- That's what she wanted. She was like, I wanna hear some ACDC. I wanna- <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not quite that far back, but Gob it, at the Calgary Stampede was my first concert that I ever went to. So <laughs> I was ended up talking to a stranger next to me in the mosh pit who lost their flip-flop. Like the things that you remember. Who, right? flip -flops with the, who mosh pits with a flip-flop? <laughs> You were just asking for it at that point. <laughs> I love it. What was your first? <laughs> oh, uh, Brittany. And I tried to see her a number of years ago when she had her Vegas residency and she took Thanksgiving off. And then she decided to not do <laughs> concerts for a while. So I am a lifelong um, Brittany person. I like people who can uh, you know, go through something public and, and continue to go through life. And it's not all sunshines and rainbows. And oftentimes we need to make the best of it. And plus her music, just, it makes me want to work or work out or move or yeah. Um, funny. So are you from, you're not from Calgary, are you? How did you find yourself at the Stampede? I am from Calgary originally. That's where I spent part of my youth. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> All right, this is really good. So our next question is, how do we know each other? So essentially, um, I'll just spoil it. We don't. And you guys are going to get to listen to us not being able to know each other. Um, and normally I do ask the questions, but sometimes I answer them. Uh, the reason I reached out to Kathleen is because she became highly requested from a recent grad of mine um, saying that Kathleen made all the difference in helping him choose which path to go through. So this podcast will be specifically directed in large part, but not only, to uh, students going into perhaps their fourth year accounting majors, uh, perhaps their students, graduates or otherwise, who are thinking about going into the CPA program. Uh, and perhaps it's people just wondering, you know, what options are out there and is it something they could see themselves or a friend going towards? Uh, we'll cover some other ground. Um, and I think that we are, yeah, we'll just get to learn about what it was, um, the different options that you made um, to help him feel better in his decision to go um, with CPA PEP. So I want to know a little bit about you. Um, <laughs> so how did you, like, what did you do before you came to CPA Atlantic? And, you know, kind of tell us the path that brought you um, to CPA Atlantic. Yeah, so I actually came to CPA Atlantic from my role before this was I spent two years working at a marketing agency out west on Vancouver Island. And um, I was working there and worked my way into a project manager type role at the marketing agency. So I had a lot of experience kind of helping different companies plan campaigns and working with all of the different staff members to kind of all of those moving pieces within a campaign to take it from discovery and planning through to execution and getting it live. And so when I moved out to 
Nova Scotia and I was looking for something in education. Um, obviously this role working it with the marketing team at CPA Atlantic doing recruited kind of aligned pretty well with that uh, immediate background and some of my interests. And so that was how I found myself in my current role. Amazing. So oftentimes we hear about accountants that go out and work in other you know, roles, maybe accounts at marketing firms. So it's really nice to hear, you know, the compliment on the other side, you know, a marketer coming to be a part of uh, and working with accountants. So yeah. <laughs> that's really, really neat because oftentimes in school and what I've, um, you know, being in education, I feel like I get to re-experience a number of the things that I once saw, you know, a couple decades ago when I did my undergrad. And one of them was, you know, recalling that when I went through, oftentimes you felt like you were in silos. This is accounting. This is marketing. This is strategy. By the way, I once said the word strategy in an advanced accounting class and the students almost revolted, like two of them. And I was like, I'm sorry, what's, what's so upsetting? And they're like, this is accounting. This isn't strategy. <laughs> and I'm like, why do you think we account? And like, if you can't have a seat at the table and talk strategy, like, what are you like? And like, what are you, what are you accounting for? If it's not for strategy and forward looking and understanding where have we been, where we want to go. So it's, I, I saw you laughing. So would you agree that you, you see it not as siloed? I couldn't agree more, Sam, in all honesty. Yeah, exactly. Right. I really am able to see that kind of bigger thing. And I think that's part of really the messaging that we work to get out. Right. And especially me and my role in engaging with students is, is bringing them out of that mindset of, you know, that CPA means traditional account and someone spending their day in front of a spreadsheet balancing numbers, right? It couldn't be further from the truth. And uh, I think that's the great thing about, you know, folks are looking for some security and making a big decision, right? And so being able to pursue the CPA, is something that's going to kind of let them weave their career in and out of different industries and pathways and levels. Uh, yeah, I'm right there with you and agreeing that it, it means a lot more than just kind of those concepts that you learn in isolation a lot when you're, you know, in university and focusing on one course at a time, right? Being able to tie that all together. Yeah. So it sounds like for those, for those listening to this, they're probably kind of familiar with the CPA program. They know it's graduate level, and I'm just going to distinguish CPA PEP, the professional education program um, from CPA. And I know it went through some rebranding. I'm just going to call it by prep. And um, that's on me, um, but that's kind of the undergrad equivalence um, that somebody could take if perhaps they didn't do an accounting major in university. Um, perhaps they did in neuroscience. I've had candidates that done neuroscience taken prep with one of the regions like Atlantic or the West, and then went on to PEP. So it sounds like um, from what you're saying is that students, you know, can start shifting the mindset of being in silos to when they get to CPA know that it will be all smushed together and you will start developing really those professional skills, continue to develop those professional skills um, to create your own adventure with one, one designation to kind of chart your own path. Would you say that's accurate? I love that. <laughs> you should be doing the marketing with us then. That's perfect. Oh my goodness, I would be honored. <laughs> Choose your own adventure CPA pop-up <laughs> book. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it is, um, you know, I have dedicated much of my life uh, as you have to this because we believe in it, right? We've, we've seen it happen. We've seen the anecdotal evidence. We have seen the, the data, the numbers. We've seen the empowerment. Like, for example, you said it's not just traditional accounting. Like, if you love spreadsheets and you want one job for the rest of your life, you know, it's going to be harder and harder to get, but you can still probably get that with this, you know, designation if you really, really wanted to. If you want an international ticket uh, to punch and go work in other countries, um, go work in this country, go work in um, HR, strategic HR, work in whatever. Like you have this basis, this foundation. Um, I got to say, Sam, that's the one that appeals to me most. And that I, I often say to students when I'm chatting with them, you know, that I wish there had been someone to kind of let me know that benefit of the designation because I actually chose international business as my concentration um, at my BBA level, right? I was lucky enough to live overseas a couple times growing up. And so I kind of had that bug and that desire to um, work internationally. And I definitely had this misguided belief that like that was the ticket, right? That getting an international business degree was going to give me that skill set to find interesting jobs abroad, you know? And, and now I kind of see, oh, wait, 
the CPA probably would have been a much better global passport in terms of being able to get work visas and find some of those opportunities abroad, you know, so for folks that that is a aspirational item for them. Yeah, the, the CPA is certainly a great um, I, w- I wish someone had taught me that. Yeah, I am. Um, and I'm sure you would agree, like part of what we try to do is what are things that we would have wanted to have? <laughs> like what are, I would have loved to have been able to like listen in on some conversations, um, just really understand, hey, what if I did this? What about this? And then tell, you know, see some different paths and then just kind of have a bit more, like you said, security, because it is a big decision. This is, what would you say? Like a two and a half, three year commitment um, to, to really taking the next, you know, foundational base in your career. Uh, there's 30 months of, um, verified work experience, either self-verified or if you go to an approved path method, so, you know, self-verified, um, correct me if I'm wrong, is where the onus is kind of on the learner. So they're able to find a job and if it ticks a number of the boxes and a number of the, um, levels level one, level two for the various technical enabling competencies, um, then they can get their CPA. Or they can go to a place, industry or firms have them now, I think government possibly too, yep. where it's a proved path. And then the onus is really on the employer to make sure that you tick all the right boxes. Both are okay, yep. both are great, um, and will get you to your CPA 30 months later. Would you say that's fair? That is fair. And I would say, you know, the key part is finding the right place for you, right? So I do sometimes in talking with students find that they put those blinders on because they really want to find a job with one of the pre-approved training offices. And that's a great option. These are great companies. They're, you know, committed to helping candidates through the program. That's why they've become pre-approved. But there are a lot of other great opportunities out there that students can still, as you said, you know, report through the experience verification on, right? And so I spend a lot of time kind of telling students, great, great if you see those jobs, certainly go for them if that's the right organization for you, but don't limit your possibilities to companies that are only pre-approved. There's a lot out there. That's a really, really good point. Uh, What suggestions do you have to find uh, the the verification? uh, Ooh, I'm so sorry. Uh, What's it called again? The The experience verification. Yeah. that um what it would be your suggestion for them to like find those jobs because they wouldn't say you know like approved training path would say it in the description but the approved um my goodness um the verification model wouldn't so how could they find a job that might fit like where do they you're right it's still reading between the lines in terms of the job description right so even if it's not necessarily advertised as a job you know it still might say that uh, a cpa candidate is preferred well that gives them a pretty good indication that it would match up right um there are ways to kind of understand but we also have a little self-assessment tool that's available too. cpa canada has on the website so they could run a job description through the tool and get an idea of is this going to work more easily they can shoot me an email and say Kathleen I've got this interview next week I think I want this job would it count for CPA right and we'll give them some feedback Um, in terms of kind of tips for finding those jobs I appreciate that for you know your fresh grads and your students now it's been an interesting year right they haven't had all those same opportunities the networking opportunities that normally take place in person and I know uh, all of the organizations are doing what they can to still be there virtually, but of course it's harder for students to have that chance to connect with some of the recruiters, get a feel for different employers, right? Um, so, you know, a great resource we've got here in Halifax, for example, is the Connector Program, the Halifax Partnership, right? Yeah. That is a great way mm-hmm. for um, fresh grads who feel like I, I don't have the network I really want just yet, you know, to start developing yeah. that network. Yeah, so that's something that you mentioned would be great for recent grads. Um, Would that also be applicable to perhaps somebody that recently became a CPA and is looking for their next move on? Well, yeah, you're right. It would be. I mean, it's available for folks at all levels and also for, you know, newcomers and internationally trained accountants who are trying to build their network and develop it here. Um, But also a great thing for CPAs to get involved with as a connector, you know, (laughs) help inspire some of the up and comers as well. 
Yeah, that's a really, really great resource. And I mean, it is, and just not one that enough people have top of mind. Of course, they've got, you know, the LinkedIn profiles are all great for so many of these students. That's something that's been drilled into them and they're doing well. They know where to look, you know, online, but you Mm -hmm. kind of forget about, well, what about those opportunities to still meet folks face to face? Oh, completely. And especially after, like you said, this past year, there might be a bigger and bigger appetite to kind of make those connections IRL in real life. <laughs> yeah. um, perfect. And I am making notes. So I will link below and also to your email. So thank you um, for saying that people can email you because that's always a question that comes up. So I really, really do appreciate that. So, okay. Um, I'm going to dig into this because I'm really curious about you and what your average day looks like. And first of all, just for those who might be wondering, um, what is your you know, official title or you know, how would you present yourself to candidates or potential candidates? So I'm the senior student recruitment advisor on our team with the CPA Atlantic School of Business, and I'm responsible for Nova Scotia as my region. So I get to help uh, all of the folks in the province here who are considering pursuing the CPA designation. Um, so the role is a little bit, you know, seasonal, obviously, in terms of my engagement with students on campus, right? I spend a lot of time in, you know, September, October, and February, and March, visiting campus, if, if allowed, um, attending classroom sessions, doing office hours where students can come to me one-on-one and, you know, bring me their transcripts and say, oh, I need another set of eyes on this. Am I missing any courses? Am I good to go? Or they can talk me through, and this one for Dow students in particular, can talk me through their co-ops, you know, as, that they've had and would like to know if that's time that they can capture. Um, or vending, networking nights. Oh, hold on, groups. hold on. Are you saying that some of the time that our Dow students in their mandatory um, BCom co-op program could count towards their 30 months of uh, experience to become a CPA? You got it. Dow students in particular, because of the mandatory co-op program, come really well equipped to be able to do that. So CPA candidates can actually take up to 12 months of work they did before their CPA candidate and started the program. And if it's relevant, they can apply it to the 30 month requirement. So some of your students who may have three accounting related pro-ops, if they've been coming back and doing progressive work, can come to our door and say, I've got 12 months done and I only need 18 more months of my work experience. Wow, I, that's amazing. And yeah, when you say accounting and progressive accounting, um, it's always good to ask because um, it means something different to each one of us. And students are often, I find, they discount their work and they discount their experience. And they'll say like things like, oh, well, I was just a you know, junior analyst or you know, I was just, and it's like, listen, in order to like understand more, we have to start somewhere. And when you dig into what you actually did, you'll probably, they might even be surprised in what they've all accomplished. So it's worth a question, worth an email or some office hours. For sure. Wow, that is such a, that is a benefit. Wow. Um, (laughs) Cool. So, okay, you say it's seasonal. So when would you say kind of out of the months are the busiest for you? Those are the busiest. So yeah, uh, September, October and February and March are my busiest with um, students at, you know, engaging with students at university. But the rest of the year, there's always things to do, right? As part of my role too, I also engage with the workforce here, you know, I'll attend different offices and do lunch and learns with their, with their staff who are interested in finding out more about the CPA program or join our, you know, um, practical experience team for a meeting with an employer to decide or help them decide if they would like to become one of the new pre-approved mm. offices, right? So there's always kind of a lot to do. And then just doing one-on-one meetings, you know, I appreciate that it is not um, a one-size-fits-all pathway, right? There is a lot of customization that people don't realize. And as you said earlier in this session, in this call, you know, you got folks who are coming from I did my degree in kinesiology and now I want to do a CPA. Obviously that pathway is going to look a bit different than your fourth year accounting students who have had your guidance and they knew to take all the prerequisite courses and they're ready to go, right? Um, So I love just kind of engaging with folks one-on-one, you know, helping them see, is this the right path for me? And if so, let's come up with an action plan to get there. Perfect. So one question I receive a lot from our fourth year DAL accounting students is if I take all my DAL accounting prerequisites um, to become um, a BCom major in accounting and I graduate, will I have to do any other courses before I can start CPA PEP? How would you answer that? 
So if they have followed the equivalency grid, and that is worth noting, right? Because at some institutions, you know, an accounting degree doesn't necessarily mean every single CPA prerequisite course, you still actually have to select some as your upper level business electives, right? So it is definitely worth, um, you know, checking out our website for students who haven't, or, you know, posters on campus or talking to their knowledgeable profs, right? To say, which are the CPA required courses? And if you have taken all of those, Yes, if you meet the minimum grade requirement, um, you're eligible to start the program. And that's where I'm happy to connect with folks. You know, we don't all have a perfect semester every semester in university, right? If you had a rough time at one stage and you know a grade or two slipped below that requirement, let's find a way to kind of get that course done over the summer or to help them pick it up so they can start the program. But, but most folks who, you know, have that list of courses in mind and know the grade requirement they're aiming for are eligible to start the program right away. If it's, work towards that. Perfect. And I will say that um, just from the Dallas side, we, um, cause there's Tammy, myself, um, Laura, uh, Kyla, who have all been heavily involved in prior, um, uh, oh my goodness, uh, Joan, uh, you know, so they really set the groundwork to ensure that our Dallas County majors, as long as you get the minimum for, uh, grade requirement, which uh, I believe is like a C or a C plus um, equivalency. Um, and again, Kathleen can check your particular um, transcript because there is a difference between like core and non-core courses. So like your intro one, intro two, and your upper level. Um, but if you have been getting well above your C's um, in all of your courses and you have your Dallas County major, then you, um, you'll, you'll be good to go. And it's nice to just kind of meet with Kathleen sooner rather than later to make sure that you have the peace of mind. Um, yeah, so I really like um, students when they, when they stay in touch and let me know what's going on. And sometimes they let me know what's going on and when it's not ideal. And I think that it's nice and important to share, um, you know, the different kind of seasonalities of when you can start CPA PEP. So a uh, candidate or pardon me, a uh, future candidate, you know, Dallas accounting grad has all those courses, minimum grade level. Um, when can they start? They graduate in April. Um, when can they start CPA PEP for core one? So as soon as they want or up to 10 years later, right? There is a lot of flexibility. So one of the things we've done um, kind of over this last year and trying to make sure that there is a pathway for everyone is increased, you know, that intake, the core one, the first module, that intake to four times a year. So there is always a core one start date around the corner. And so for those students who are motivated and ready to jump right in, there's actually an intake in May that fresh grads can take advantage of. So when those final grades are released in April, if they are ready to dive right in, get started in early May, get going in the program. If you want to take a bit of a breather, there's an intake in July. We just had it get started last Saturday, actually. And then, you know, one in the fall and one in the winter. So plenty of options for a start date. And that, to some degree, is going to dictate what the rest of their path looks like as well. And so that's where, you know, again, I'm happy to connect with folks one on one so we can plan through the full thing. Because, of course, while the core and elective modules, the first four out of the six modules are all offered four times a year now, so they can take those at any point. The final two capstone modules are only offered twice a year to back mm -hmm. into the two offerings of the CFI every year, right? So with the four intakes, not everyone leads to a back-to-back -back path to one of those capstone offerings. So depending when you start, you may have to take a semester off to lead into a capstone offering, right? Yeah, you may have to. Or you may want to. People get married, it. people want to take the summers off. I had one um, student and he took one module a year because he, he was in a job that he liked. He um, you know, had some other stuff going on in his life and he was like, I want to stay connected in the program, um, but I don't, I don't want to do it all year. So he did one per year. And then um, when it came to capstones, he did capstone one and capstone two and wrote the CP and is now a CPA. So. It, like you said, there really is a path for everybody. So sit down, have a conversation. If this is something that you think might be of interest, you might find out in a conversation, maybe it's not for you right now. Maybe it is for you, but not till later. Um, or maybe you wanna know how can you get in and rip the bandage off and become a CPA and go live in the Netherlands or Australia. And, <laughs> and you know, like, it's, it's literally different for everybody. So I'm so grateful that your 
A, so open and B, like your role really is, um, has that education component at heart to make it um, accessible to, to the learners. And I think you mentioned a few other things um, as we were going over with emails and I got really excited because um, something that um, we said, you know, take a module per year and that's an option. Or if you don't like that the modules are going in eight weeks, um, you're saying that there's an, another option? You got it, yeah. So we started offering the extended version of the core and elective modules. So those first four modules of the program, the folks are needing a little bit more time to absorb the material and that is absolutely fine, right? If you are adjusting to a new job, you just finished going hard at a BCom for many years and you kind of want to ease into your CK studies, the extended offering actually runs over about, you know, five months. So it's 20 weeks instead of eight weeks. Bringing your study time down to about 10 hours a week, which is a lot more manageable, right? And so, um, you know, maybe in particular too, for if, you, if there are students starting the path whose co-ops or relevant or work term in the past wasn't applicable. So they still are, you know, 30 months out from getting the designation because they're just now starting in a relevant role. Well, in that case, take a nice slow path through the academic part too, right? Don't rush yourself through it if you're not getting to the the CPA designation any sooner. It's a great option. And also just for students with different strengths and weaknesses, right? If you just went, oh my goodness, I can't wrap my head around taxation. This one is just not my strength. Just take that particular module in the extended format then and take some more time with it and make it a bit easier on yourself, right? Absolutely. And this it's so fascinating because I got to know uh, a learner at West, a candidate who was taking she took a few of the modules um, regular, and then she, um, she got laid off during the pandemic and decided, hey, I'm gonna take a couple of these extended. And then she went into Capstone 1, um, which isn't offered extended. Um, and she did Capstone 1 and Capstone 2 in the spring and then wrote the May CP. And it actually reignited her love for learning. She said she took about a week off and then started um, a, like a Coursera course on Indigenous studies and then took up other learning opportunities. So she just found like, she's like, I want to keep progressing on the path, but I, I need some time. Like, you know, there's life events, there's COVID, um, there was her work and she is in such a good place now. And even just, yeah, her emails are so like much um, like enthused and it really is. You're going to have the same designation. You write the same exams. There's no differentiator anywhere. It, it really just is. What is your life looking like? What do you want it to look like? And how can you kind of make it, make it fit? So that's really cool. Okay. So I'm glad that, yeah, these mechanisms are in place. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm just so curious about your role. So I guess I could guess, but I want to hear from you. What excites you about your job? Well, it's, it's, it's exactly that. And some of the changes we made over the last year, it's getting to help students, right? The reason that I kind of ended up, in addition to having that, you know, marketing background that made this type of role appeal to me, the reason that I knew I wanted to work in education was actually because of the master's program that I chose to do. Um, I, I followed up my BBA in international business with a master's of global business. Mm. And so the program I chose was one that uh, actually takes you as a cohort. And I went and did part of my degree. So it started at University of Victoria. And then I went to Taiwan with my cohort and did a semester there. And then I went to Austria and did a semester there. And so it is a global business. It was a global business degree that actually had you you know, applying all those cultural difference by living and attending school in, you know, North America, Europe, and Asia, and actually working and doing a project with a company in each place. And after I graduated from that, I really kind of walked away from my education feeling like that is exactly what a global business degree should be, right? <laughs> is actually putting it together and living it. And that's what kind of ignited my passion for um, the education sector and really being involved in programs that are forward thinking and actually kind of really helping students, you know, walk away feeling the way I did. Like, yeah, I, I got what I wanted out of that. Um, and that was a well thought out and designed program. And so that's one of the things that excites me about working with the profession the most and especially seeing the way over, you know, the strange COVID year we've had, the way the school adapted to offering these extended offerings, increasing our offerings of the core and the elective modules, increasing the French offerings so that 
more people can feel like, oh, I see my way through this pathway now, you know, and, and, uh, and that's exciting. And it's really brings a lot of joy kind of helping students um, feel that way. Amazing. Yeah. And then the thing you hit on was, you know, having this great knowledge and applying it. And I feel like that is what CPA does, um, both within the program, but then also as you go through, like both within the modules, there is like, that's all you're doing is you're applying. You have these users with their needs and you got to figure them out and then you got to help them just like you would um, with a client or with the boss sometimes or in an interview or, you know, walking down the street. Um, and so you're both doing it in the program, but then as a part of the program and um, your work experience and applying it because, you know, I don't think it's going to cut it anymore or it hasn't for a long time, um, that theory on its own without that application piece, right? And really just adding that value um, and, and digging in and getting that confidence too. So it sounded like that was a really formative um, experience for you and really ignited your, your passion and where you see yourself. Yeah. Well, cool. what was your favorite food in Thai? Uh, did you say Taipei or Taiwan? In Taiwan, I was in. Um, and, you know, I had never had bubble tea before in my really? life because I just was like, that's a little weird of a texture. And I absolutely got obsessed with some. There was this place right by our hostel that you could walk to on the way into the university in the morning and get a uh, nice milk bubble tea. And that was one of my favorite local things that. Uh, a lot of people are like, how have you not had bubble tea? <laughs> but I've never had. Especially Calgary, because we have like the like we have some really, really, really good um bubble tea in Calgary. So <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Tapioca, is it tapioca or pearls? Exactly. The pearls. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. <laughs> yeah. Um, my favorite is like a pineapple coconut one. So it's kind of like a pina colada. <laughs> oh. <laughs> or watermelon. Watermelon was good too. Oh. <laughs> um okay so yeah um what do you like to do for fun then now like it sounds like you are working a lot um and are involved in a lot are likely talking and listening and interacting a lot so you know what do you like to do for fun how do you either relax or recharge or you know what does your off time look like well, one of the great things is because I was a uh, Nova Scotia transplant, you know, when I got out here and, and starting with the CPA Atlantic School was my first role in moving to Nova Scotia. And so getting to um, travel around the province for work has been a great way to actually get to see the province. You know, that was kind of a fun bonus of this role. So I do like to take some time when I am up in, you know, Cape Breton to, to take a day off on one end and, and do some exploring. So I have had a lot of fun kind of exploring Nova Scotia in my free time, but I'm also a huge homebody. I will admit it, right? I'm, um, I like to sew and quilt and I love to bake. I usually bring the staff here at the school baked goods every Monday oh. to make Mondays a little easier. <laughs> totally totally what's your specialty like what's your favorite thing to make that you're like this is mine like the, you're welcome uh that would be cream puffs <laughs> yes i love cream puffs oh my goodness okay i will be looking at my inbox for the invite for the next time <laughs> so that is very exciting Mm. Do you um, like and the other thing I really like to do to get me out there too is I foster dogs through one of our local dog rescues here and so it's always good when I've got an active foster dog to get me out exploring as well yeah totally totally no I, I love it um oftentimes students seeing here people and what they're doing what they're accomplishing and how they're helping and it's just really nice to give context that it's like yeah you can do work and you can have work that they're, you know, you're invested in and has impact, but you also, you know, health and wellness and, you know, recharging and doing what lights you up. Like it helps you be better at your work and helps you just live a happier life and vice versa. Right. So that's awesome. And, oh, what's uh, your foster dog's name right now? Her name is Shiva and she is about a 60 pound dog who thinks she belongs in my lap. She's one of the most affectionate ones I've had yet. So a lot of fun. I love that. Oh, oh goodness. Okay, so if we were talking to specifically Dal accounting majors, third and fourth year, we've covered a lot of ground. I'm really like, I'm thrilled. I think they've gotten a lot out of it. What else? Like what advice would you give them? It might be program specific. It might be something that I am not expecting at all. So 
You know, one of the things that I'm seeing right now um, is a, a bit of a change in the workforce and the demand, right? We're seeing a shift in the labor market here. And I think students may have more agency than they realize right now, you know? So I would say one of my pieces of advice would be, you know, I certainly know there is a sense of kind of wanting to take advantage of opportunities that are presented to you and right, but students should also be making sure that they are finding the right fit and doing, you know, taking the job that kind of most aligns with their, their career goals and culturally seems like a fit. And I think now more than ever, they are able to do that, right? To have that stay and not necessarily feel that as much of a pressure to kind of take the first opportunity that presents itself. So that would be one of my pieces of advice for right now for students is, is kind of knowing your worth right now as a potential employee employee in this, you know, current labor market and making sure you select something that's going to excite you. We spend a lot of time at our jobs. You can't hate going to work every day. You know, it's got to be a good fit for you, right? Um, so. Absolutely. Like what, what are environment are you working in now? Who are you working with? Um, what are the paths there? Or as well, okay, I'm here for two or three years. What are the opportunities that come after this that could open up? Um, you know, what are the trade-offs? Um, you know, where am I working? How am I working? What does that look like? Do I value um, autonomy and working from home one, one to three, four more days a week? You know, what does that look like? And asking the questions. Um, here's something, because I still need to, I love advocating for others. And, um, you know, one of the ways that I've been able to advocate for myself is knowing that if I want to talk the talk, I better well walk the walk. And so one thing that I've gotten comfortable with is saying, would you consider X? Because it's a way to open the door in a way for me to ask and advocate for myself, but do it in a way that feels authentic to me. Um, so what are your thoughts on if somebody were to want to work from home or want to want to maybe take a year off, still work with the company, but not do CPA right now? What are your thoughts, Kathleen, if a potential employee during the interview process, you know, maybe they got an offer and they say, love this, love the company, love the fit. Would you consider if I work from home, you know, one to two days a week? What are your thoughts about that kind of approach? I think that. That example in particular, you know, is an interesting one because obviously companies have been adjusting to the work, you know, the virtual work from home and kind of we see that everywhere, right? As companies that that in particular, I think is maybe a concession more willing to make right now because a lot of them were able to implement processes that are working over the last, you know, during the pandemic and kind of see that um, some of those things that felt like mental hurdles early in the pandemic or, you know, that organizations were resistant to, well, we've kind of ironed a lot of it out, right? So in, in particular, working from home, maybe one that students may have a bit of um, a reception to that's, that's warmer than they might've thought, especially if it's an employer that already has some of their workforce doing that, you know, but I, I do think it is, um, important for students to be their own advocate and kind of voice what they need. Uh, although I can appreciate it's, it is challenging when you are interviewing for a job, you know, to, you don't want to overplay your hand. <laughs> Absolutely. And I really, um, let me know if you disagree or agree. I don't think there's a wrong move a student can make. If you're respectful and you're treating others the way in which you would want somebody, in, like if the roles are reversed, where you would still feel respected and valued. If you ask questions and you know, maybe you decide, you know, I'm so excited about this opportunity. Uh, I'm willing to take whatever, you know, like, um, you know, work however they want me to do, whatever they want. And like, there's no shame in that either, right? We've all been in different positions and different things that make us feel comfortable. And, and that's okay too. So, and so maybe that's something that you put in the back of your mind and you revisit it six months and you say, hey, I've been here for six months. Um, I'd like to talk about my performance to see if there's anything else I can do to add value to the company. And once they're like, oh, you're amazing. You're like, great. Um, would you consider me working from home <laughs> or whatever, you know, include X if you're, it's your passion. So yeah. um, I think that's right on the nose, right? Performance reviews are always a part of the process for new employees. That way you've gotten a chance to back yourself up a little bit, right? And so you can show them kind of that you are the right person for the job and you are delivering on, you know, what you said you would in that role, it gives you a little bit more opportunity to then kind of reevaluate that. Yeah. Okay. So you just, I like to bounce around because linear is overdone. Um, when you came out to 
the East Coast. Like, how did you know it was the right time to leave your, your previous job? Because oftentimes, you know, people will be so excited about getting the job and so excited about the next part of their career. And eventually, maybe they're thinking, hmm, there's something else I want to do. Or, you know, I'm not quite sure if now is the time to move on. So we often like to ask, and my students are actually the ones who provided this question, how did you know it was right for you to leave your last job? And any regrets? Now that is a difficult one for me to answer, Sam, only because I'm not sure it would be advice I would necessarily give. So with me, it wasn't so much as knowing it was time to leave my job. It was, um, you know, as I said earlier, I, I kind of grew up living in a couple of different countries and places. And so um, I wasn't the type to set down roots for too long. And I was getting to a point where I was ready for a change from the life that I'd had on Vancouver Island for, for you know, a number of years. Um, so I quit my job and I packed up my car and I drove across the country <laughs> with no job and <laughs> nothing this lined up exactly, and having no, no, never no. been to Halifax before. <laughs> this is exactly the type of advice that we need to give. It really is, right? <laughs> I do think sometimes you just kind of have to have faith in your in yourself um, and knowing that you'll be able to, to land, right? And, and I did. And, um, it, you know, me and my dog made the trip and it was great. <laughs> so, I love this. By the way, you aren't the first person on this podcast to basically do that, to quit their job, hop in the car and drive across the country. The other person went the other way. Um, but no, but it's so true. It's because... Sometimes it isn't so much about like having the perfect path lined up or having all the boxes too. Sometimes it's like, listen to yourself. And like you said, having the faith that you have the tools to figure it out and then figuring it out. Thank you. Thank you for sharing and being real. Like that is awesome. No, um, it works out. Um, okay. So perhaps there was, um, like I, I know if I made a road trip across country today, I would need like a good audiobook or podcast or something to listen to. Um, in fact, I'm going to go home to Calgary in a few weeks and see my parents. And I'm already thinking, okay, what audibles do I need to get? What podcasts do I need to load up on? So do you have any, um, you know, recent books or podcast recommendations, perhaps for me, perhaps for our, our grads? What do you, what do you like to listen to? Okay, here's one that checks both of those boxes. So the podcast that I'm most into right now is called Overdue. And I think their tagline is something like um, podcast about the books you've been meaning to read. And so they do each episode. There's two gentlemen that do it who went to, you know, a small liberal arts college together. But they bounce off where it's a book that's either a classic that you should have read at some point, or it's just a book that's in the zeitgeist right now, you know, and is coming up in conversations. And one of them will read it before the weekly podcast and explain it to the other person. And they are funny and they are great. And it's a little way for me as someone who's like, I'm really into the classics and I've been taking advantage of, you know, the it's Project Gutenberg where you can get all the books in the public commons now, right? And, and so reading some of those books that uh, are easy to access. And so it's fun because you don't always have someone to talk to about, I don't know, the picture of Dorian Gray, right? It's not on everyone's most recent have read list. And so to then find this podcast episode about it or to get inspired to read a new classic because of it. Um, they're books that you know you've heard of and yeah, it's a lot of fun. So that's one of my recommendations. I really love that. Thank you so, so much. Um, yeah, that's a good twofer. I also like efficiencies. <laughs> that's like a good total check mark. Amazing. Okay, so I, I like to ask one question to all my guests. Some love it. Um, some manage um, to, to humor me um, because it is really kind of personal. And it's personal for a reason. Um, how would you define success, Kathleen? So for me, it is finding a way to be happy with your lot, really, right? I mean, I think we all have different aspirations in terms of our career or our family life, and, and that's absolutely fine, but recognizing, having some self-awareness to know what it is that you, that you want and, um, and, you know, feeling happier, happiness or acceptance in I don't want to say settling for that because that doesn't that doesn't sound right. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I think it's really yeah, finding a way to kind of align your expectations and and so um, you know, just for example, I know for I'm not someone that ever is going to aspire to be 
you know, a CEO. I don't want to run my own business. I don't want to run someone else's. And that is absolutely fine with me that that isn't my overall career goal. That's absolutely great for the folks who it is to have the tools to work towards that. Um, but, you know, just kind of knowing, I, I guess, having that self-awareness to know where I overall want my career goals to fall and land and being satisfied with that and aiming for those. So Absolutely. And I would, I would say it's, it's the furthest from settling. I think that if, you know, we take somebody else's definition of success and work towards that, I almost think that that would be settling because then you're not getting to know you and your, what you value and what you align. And, you know, sometimes students will ask about, you know, time management or how do I fit it all in or how do I do all this? And, you know, anecdotally, I find if I'm listening to myself, and I'm working within my own energy, you know, what are my values? What are my goals? What am I working towards? Is it aligning with all that? Then the energy management works itself out and time, you know, I think we've all been in those like meetings or like those tasks where, you know, it's one of those have to do's, perhaps we forget the big picture and it take, feels like it takes forever. And then conversely, we've been in these items where it, it's like six hours later and we're like, whoa, where did those six hours go? So I think it's quite the opposite. And I don't, I don't know what's worse. If somebody lines up their goals because they feel like they should do it or they have to do it, I don't know if it's worse if they hit those goals or don't hit those goals. I don't know. So yeah, alignment. Um, thank you. That's super powerful. <laughs> Final comments. Any, anything to add? Anything about the program? Anything um, that perhaps I've missed or that you know, you're like, Students always ask me this. Why didn't you ask me? Or, you know, what, what else? A final comments or anything to add? Um, I guess just reiterating to your students that I am another resource for them, right? And I know how lucky they are to have, you know, the profs and the folks at Management Career Services. There are a lot of great people who are in their court and helping support them um, as they work through their degree. And I'm happy to be one of those people too, you know. Um, I really think that the most important part of my role is kind of helping folks decide if this is the right next step for them and if that is and they feel excited about that helping them get there you know that's where I get the most joy so by all means I'm happy to connect with any of your students who would like to reach out um, I'd be happy to kind of help them as I can and guide them towards that perfect yeah no I will be linking your email. I'll also be linking um, that connector um, information into our, our notes. And yeah, thank you so, so much for investing the time um, with us today. Thanks very much for having me.